In this lecture, we are going to talk about the geography of China, especially to single out those elements that will play a significant part in the context between China and the West. From both a morphological and a climatic point of view, today's China can be divided in two parts with a line that stretches from Yunnan in the southwest to Heilongjiang in the northeast. East China is quite different from West China. It lies under the influence of the monsoons and its mountains, although quite high, never reach the extremely high altitudes of West China. The geographical distribution of extremely high mountains in the west and the sea in the east accounts for the fact that all great Chinese rivers flow from west to east. North-south waterways are often man-made, as is the case in a very large scale of 6th century Grand Canal that links the Yangtze Basin with the North China Plain. Is China is the part that corresponds basically with China proper that we have talked about in previous lectures. Is China can be divided in turn between North and South China by a line that stretches along the river Huai. North and South China are quite different from each other. North China is the China of the Yellow River. This is an immense river, more than 5,000 kilometers long that winds its way from west to east, as all Chinese rivers do. It is called the Yellow River because it carries enormous quantities of yellow silt coming from the hilly area of the lowest plateau, a very fertile terrain of yellow soil that slides down to the river with any heavy rain. Flooding is so frequent that the Yellow River has been called China's sorrow. Floods became especially dangerous when the Yellow River enters the North China Plain, a region densely populated since ancient times and meanders on for almost a thousand kilometers. This is the zone that produces dry cereals like millet, barley and wheat, and where pasta is eaten. Maybe Marco Polo brought it from here to Italy. North China has also been the seat of many Chinese capitals. Chang'an, that was on many occasions capital of Imperial China, and Beijing. South China, on the other hand, is the land of the Yangtze River, a huge span of water that flows for more than 6,000 kilometers and provides a major transportation artery through the center of the country. The Yangtze and its many tributaries flow through the Yangtze Basin, which is much warmer and moister than the Yellow River Basin. The Yangtze Basin is an extremely wet and fertile region, more than five times the size of Germany, where it is possible to harvest twice a year. This is the land of rice and of a large variety of fruits and vegetables. Rivers and canals link the whole region, which is one of the most urbanized areas in the world. Seeing it prompted Matteo Ricci to say in the 16th century that the whole of China was like a huge city. To the west of the Yangtze Basin lies Sichuan, an extremely rich region the size of the Iberian Peninsula, which has been an independent state many times throughout Chinese history. South of Sichuan is Yunnan, home of many non-Chinese dynasties. It was incorporated into the Chinese world only a thousand years ago by armed forces of both Mongols and Ming. This is why Marco Polo went there as an envoy from the Mongol Khan. In the south, there is the Xijiang River, which, as we have seen in previous lectures, has been connected by canals to the Yangtze southern tributaries, since the beginning of the Chinese Empire in the 3rd century BCE. At its mouth lies Canton, a city connected since ancient times to the walls of Southeast Asia. Alongside, the Portuguese established their first stronghold in China, Macau. In the southeast is Fujian, a mountainous territory that was not fully incorporated into China until the Tang in the 7th century. The territory combines a quite difficult terrain for agriculture with the fantastic natural harbors that have sealed its destiny. 
Here lie the ports from which Chinese seafarers set sail. South China too has on many occasions been the seat of the Chinese capitals, the most famous of them being Hangzhou and Nanjing. The difference between North and South China are also evident in the coastline. North China's coastline stretches along the shores of the North China Plain, where the Yellow River reaches the sea heavily loaded with sediments. Endless beaches and sandy waters make navigation difficult and keep classical China away from the sea. The classical texts of Chinese central tradition are notably devoid of reference to the sea. There is no Chinese equivalent of the Odyssey. By contrast, the southern seas offer some of the best harbors in the world. Its ports have always been so full of traffic that they made Martin de Rada say in 1575 that they could house an infinite quantity of ships because there were so many of them that it was frightening being unable to count them. It is from these ports south of the Yangtze that contact with the maritime outside world was initiated. From Fujian, boats set sail to the Ryukyu, a string of islands stretching from Japan to Taiwan that acted as free ports when China or Japan or both banned maritime relations. From Fujian too came the Fujianese migrants who established themselves in the Philippines as soon as the Spanish landed there. Canton had since the Han Dynasty active harp relations with Southeast Asia. With the Tang, it had already become a thriving merchant city with a huge population of traders. 120,000 foreign merchants were killed there in the Great Rebellion of Huangzhou in 879. With trade came also the establishment of Chinese migrants in Southeast Asia. Cheng He, the great Chinese 15th century navigator, about, about whom we will speak in later lectures, found a colony of Cantonese migrants settled in Sumatra. By then, the Chinese had been active for centuries in the waters of the East China Sea and of the South China Sea, both of them on the edge of the Pacific Ocean. But the Chinese will never ply the waters of the Pacific Ocean itself. Before any sailor could confront the massive span of the Pacific, millennia would be spent mastering shipbuilding technology and the accurate knowledge of winds and maritime currents. Only then could the Pacific Ocean be crossed, and this didn't happen until the 16th century. The first vessels that ventured to cross this ocean were not Chinese, but Spanish. Even so, the Pacific Ocean will play a definitive role in Chinese history, as we'll see in later lectures, when we talk about the Manila Galleon, which at the end of the 16th century linked Mexico, Manila and Ming China. A very different case was that of the Indian Ocean, that had been for millennia the richest and most travelled ocean in the world, where the greatest civilization of Asia came together, Indian, Persian, Arabian, Chinese and Southeast Asian ships crossed its waters blown by the monsoon, the regular winds that ensured the annual traffic. Spices, silks, metals, pigments, horses, perfumes and exotic goods crossed its shores and provided continuous contact between Asia, Africa and the Middle East. Even the Romans used the monsoons to sail to India. It is towards the Indian Ocean, through the Malacca Straits, that the Chinese will turn. In 1511, the Portuguese found many Chinese vessels that had crossed the Malacca Straits to go and trade in Malacca's busy port. By this point, the Chinese had already been very active in the Indian Ocean for five centuries.